God cannot lie He promised to save His people He never changed His mind Today He still calls them my people My people, my people Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Hallelujah. Here this time is in the United States of America. You notice it for the last seven or so months we've I've been broadcasting our Bible studies from different places in a the lot world. of different places. As a matter of fact, I was just saying our last one actually was in Italy, in uh, Monte Catani, Catini Terme in Italy. Yeah. So we're continuing on in our study of the seven the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. The primary purpose is to see the things that are pleasing to God, the things that are displeasing to God. And as we stated in the beginning of this study, this is kind of a picture. The seven churches represent a picture of those churches at that time, 2,000 years ago, but also kind of a historical overview through the last couple of 2,000 years. And they represent the church at any time, the overall church at any time, different, different facets of the church. So that's our purpose, is we want to know, we want to know the heart of God. We want to know His desires in our life. And that's visible in these seven letters. Ta-da! So we're in the fourth of those letters. We're in the letter to the church of Thyatira. And this should be the conclusion of that letter. This is the 19th part of the overall study. And we left off, as I said, in Italy last, uh, last time in verse 25. Revelation 2, verse 25. So we'll pick it up at verse 26. But before we do, oh, by the way, I should say, oh, yes. I should say that you may notice that we are joined by our dear brother Mark, Mark oh, Schweitzer. Oh, yeah, because it's uh, <coughs> Mark has it's been a long time. Yes, yes. So it's, it's good, good to, to be back together you. again. And by the way, we're in a hotel in Altamont Springs, Florida. Mm -hmm. So if you hear goofy noises in the background, that's hotel noises. Okay, so we'll get over it. Mark, why don't you just ask the Lord to bless our time together today. Yes, thank you. Oh, Lord, we just had Thanksgiving, and we thank you for the ability to come together. Yes. And we also thank you for your word. Yes, Lord. Just get it into our hearts yes, and our minds. Yes, Amen. Amen. Okay. So, Revelation 2.26. <clears throat> he who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He who overcomes. Now, the importance of that particular statement should be evident by this time, because it's in every one of the letters that we've talked about so far, and it's in every one of the letters that we are yet to cover. I mean, this is, this is written, the book of Revelation, it says in the very beginning, in the first chapter, is God's message to his bond servants, the bond servants of Jesus Christ. Would you consider that <clears throat> the bond servants would be the remnant? Well, I, I think that's a reasonable statement. Yeah, I do. And, and what Alice is talking about is throughout Scripture, it talks about in the end, there will be a remnant that's left. It's a small part, you know. Um, God spoke and said that not all who are, are, are circumcised are the Jews. It's those who are circumcised of heart. And in the same way, everybody that calls himself a Christian today is certainly not a disciple, a follower of, of Jesus Christ. That's right. Um, and... You know, Paul says a number of times, let a man examine himself. Yes. And it's always good to examine yourself to see if, if indeed you are following the teaching of Jesus Christ. Because that's a challenge in this day and age. We need to be being transformed yeah. into the image of God. Yeah. What does it mean to overcome? To conquer? To conquer. To be, to, uh, to be an overcomer is to be victorious in a conflict. And the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the church at Rome in that glorious 8th chapter, and if you haven't read that lately, go read it again, right? He talks about, he speaks of tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, of peril, and of the sword, and then concludes by stating, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. That's Romans 8.37. That's what it means to be an overcomer, Right? To overwhelmingly conquer. But the assumption that Paul is making when he makes that statement is clear because he's talking about those who are actually walking in faith, obeying the Word of God, 
trusting in the Word of God, all right? Those are the only ones that could come. Well, and, and that, should be, that should be a given, because as the Apostle John wrote, he said, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Right. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Yes. 1 John 5, 4. So it's our faith in what Jesus has done mm -hmm. that leads to our ability to be an overcomer. Right. Okay? Nothing of ourselves. We can't do it on our own. No, because... It, and, and you overcome in a battle. You overcome, right? I mean, that's some kind of contest, right? Some kind of conflict, right? But the battles that we face and that we're expected to be overcomers in, it reminds me of an oath that I took many, 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 many years ago, even in, in a previous life, okay, before I was saved. When I had to, before Christ. BC, before Christ, yes. Um, when I went into the military, you take an oath. Mm -hmm. Even the president takes an, ace, an oath that is similar in ways, right? And that is to defend the country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Right? You took because, the same oath? Because even, even in the world, they recognize that the battle always, it's to those who are outside, but there are those who are inside. So there's no doubt that we have an adversary, our adversary of the devil, who goes about as a roaring lion, right? And his only desire is to destroy us. You know, he's not our adversary. Oh, no, he is. Is he? Yeah, our adversary of the devil goes about as a roaring lion. Yes. I was thinking of adversary of the Holy Spirit. That's an advocate. Advocate, sorry about that. <laughs> Alice has had a little cold. We've been traveling a lot. Okay. okay a little grease. Right, right, right. Okay. Okay, right. Okay. Yes. Want to blip that one out? <laughs> <laughs> but do you want me to blip that one out? No, no. Listen, that's uh, we're all okay. we're all okay. Advocate. Yes. The but the adversary. Right. Yeah. His only desire is to destroy us. That's what Jesus said in John right. chapter ten, right? He comes to kill, to destroy, to, to steal, to rob. He's not he doesn't like us. And by the way, I don't like him. But there's one who's even more dangerous. I mean, the devil's been defeated. Yes. Okay? But there's, there's another enemy, far more dangerous, and that is us. That's right. Walt Kelly, and I'm, I'm sure most of you won't remember this. It's, uh, this is kind of a cultural thing, and I'm old enough that this is pertinent to me. Walt Kelly was a cartoonist, and I think he started in the 40s. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a cartoon strip called Pogo. Pogo was a possum in the swamp, right? Mm -hmm. And probably his most famous cartoon, which is actually, I think, in the 70s, the early 70s, shows Pogo in a, in a boat on the swamp where he lives with his friend, I think, with the alligator. And he's looking around at all of the, the trash and stuff. In the, and he says, we have met the enemy, and he is us. Well, the fact of the matter is, that's the truth. You know, we go back to the Apostle Paul one more time. He said, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. Our flesh mm -hmm. sets its desire against the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Galatians 5, 17. I mean, that's the real battle. The real enemy is the one that you see in the mirror every day. Mm -hmm. All right? That old fallen human nature is constantly battling the new creation that is truly you. That human nature. I mean, That's it's, it's one it's, of the reasons why we need to be examining ourselves. Daily. Absolutely, absolutely. And as a, as a plug, one of the books we've come back to the U.S. I want to spend some time finishing up a couple of books that I've been working on, yeah. and one of them is called "The Evidence of a Redeemed Life." And that's what it is. It's about how, how to examine your life to make sure that you are, are visibly showing God's redemptive work in your life, all right? We had a dear brother I had, uh, Arthur Burt, over in Wales. Um, we just come back from the United Kingdom, and usually we spend a lot of time or spend time with Arthur. Uh, and this year, he was, we went over, he, was, uh, we do a, he has a conference and his home in Penmanmar, North Wales, and he was too ill to, to come. Arthur is 102 years old, and up until the point he was 101 years old, he was still traveling and preaching the gospel. 
But he passed away this past August. Passed away, went into glory, went home, oh, hallelujah. Finally got his, walking in his reward. But I think a couple of years ago, here in Florida, just before we were getting ready to go back over, Arthur was here in the United States ministering, and we went to spend, or to see him in Winter Park, Florida. And Arthur has been ser was serving the Lord from, from his youth, like I said, right up until in his hundreds, right? 101, and he was 102, right after his 102nd birthday, he passed away. A few months after. A few months after. But at the end of this meeting that we had in Winter Park, Arthur prayed, and in his prayer, he ended by saying, Father, keep me faithful till the end. True to the end. Keep me true to the end. Arthur didn't take that for granted. He didn't take for granted the fact that he had the strength within himself to overcome that that old human nature. Yes. So he was trusting always in the power of the Holy Spirit that dwelt within him. He was always trusting in the Lord to keep him faithful. Yes. You see, the, the weapons, the weapons that we need to be concerned about, or be on guard against, mm -hmm. I'll put it that way, the enemy that we need to be on guard against mm -hmm. and overcome is love of self, Pride. love of money, <clears throat> boasting, arrogance, being ungrateful. Mm -hmm. These are all things that Paul writes about to the church in his second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. These are the traits that you're going to see in people in those perilous last days. And, and it kind of concludes that by saying, especially, I mean, it's people who are holding to a form of godliness, but denying its power. You know, there are, we started in the beginning of this Bible study. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians. They're holding on to that form of godliness. But where's the power? Where's that power to walk and overcome? So in this book that we're looking at, right, the book of Revelation, it deals with the last days, and it has to be remembered that Jesus said to his disciples mm -hmm. back in the Gospel of Matthew when they were, you know, when they were walking together, they came to him and they asked, you know, what are the, what are the signs? When will you return? And what are the signs of your, your coming? What are the signs of the end of the age? And Jesus said, one of the things he said, he said, at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Mm. Matthew 24, 10. These are the signs of these perilous last days. That's the signs of the end of the age. It's not happening. Falling away. You know, so many people are looking for this great revival. But this, this here, and Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, warned against a great apostasy, a great falling away. Those are people who don't overcome. Mm. Those are, those are people, brothers and sisters, who are overcome rather than overcoming themselves. You understand? Yes. That's why Jesus could say, you know, again, in that same chapter, Matthew 24, he could say, but the one who endures until the end, he will be saved. And the Apostle John, again, <coughs> would, would later write, for whatever is born of God <coughs> overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 4. No, nobody says that this is an easy task. Or, I, I don't know, that may be the wrong way to put it, you know, easy. Jesus said, come to me, all of you are weary, and I'll give you rest. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not supposed to wear us down, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We should be encouraged. Yes. And rejoice when things happen. Well, as long as you know, as long as you're overcoming. Mm -hmm. It's... The, the simple fact is you're going to you're going to have trials and tribulations. It says in Psalms, you know, many of the many of the afflictions of the righteous, the Lord but the Lord, Lord will deliver us from from them all. The, you know, there's no promise you're not going to face this stuff. Yeah. You're going to face it. And you're going to face it every day. But as you're overcoming it, and ever, as you're being victorious, there's joy in being victorious. There's joy in being, you know, winning the race, as Paul talks about, right? And knowing the promises. That God gave us. I mean, when we go through these afflictions, and we see that God can thwart the end in whatever happens. But it's choosing to walk in those, right? Yes, yes, you have to walk in believe in 
right. trust me. Well, you know, uh, I talked about the things you have to be on guard about. It's a fight. In a fight, you need you need weapons. What weapons are you want to carry? The whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God so that you might be able to stand fast against the schemes of the devil. That's what it says, right? I just I just wanted to interject this. Um, I just got an email from my sister who's in London, and she's got her grandkids that she's watching, and she said that in the morning when they go out, she dresses them in the armor. Whole armor of God. And they go through the motions. The kids they're like seven and eight or nine. And they go through the motions of putting on the whole armor of God every morning before they go out. And then she gives them a scripture. So she feeds them the breakfast of champions before they go out to them. That's that there's wisdom in that, Absolutely. I'll tell you what. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you're a parent, please don't on, don't only be on guard for yourself, but Amen. be on guard for your children. Yes. Yes. Because there is most assuredly an attack. On, on families that is, that is focused on the relationship between husbands and wives, between the children and the parents. So, Everyone needs that armor. Absolutely. Because it is a battle. Yes. But it is a battle to be won. You know, uh, I think Mark will relate to this. Cause one of my favorite books is Don Quixote de la Mancha, The Man of La Mancha written by <coughs> Cervantes, Miguel Cervantes, back in the early 1700s? 1500s. He was a contemporary of uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Well, so, okay. They, they lived about the same time. That would be the very late 1500s, early 1600s. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the story, <laughs> the, the movie that went with that, some of the music is really, really beautiful. And it's a song, The Impossible Dream. Sometimes you have to fight when people don't even know that there's a battle going on, a battle to be won. And March, the phrase I think there, for no, 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 no. <laughs> but it's to fight the uh, beatable foe. Okay. And here this guy said it's undefeatable, but right. we're still to fight it. Yes, because we know the truth, and the truth is that the battle has been won. Yes. And it's undefeatable for Those. what we can do. But for God, it's not undefeatable. It which has leads been you, defeated. Which leads us right into the next part of this verse. But should I take a little break? To dream. No, okay, we'll go ahead. He who keeps my deeds until the end. It's interesting. You know, who keep, he who keeps my deeds. How do you keep somebody else's deeds? Hmm. You know, it, it's, it doesn't say, it's not about our deeds. Jesus is saying, that we are to keep his deeds. His deeds. Now, his what deeds. he wants us to do, not what well, we no, want. No, it's not even that. The idea is, if you look at the Greek here, you know, the Greek word, in Strong's Dictionary, it talks about this word keep, all right? Mm -hmm. um, tereo means to attend to carefully, to take care of, to guard, to observe, all right? It's not what we do or what we have done, that this is talking about, it is that we are to hold on, to hold fast to, to observe and attend to what Jesus has yeah, done. Right. And overcoming is ultimately about living and walking in what Jesus has done, his deeds, right. his deeds. Right. And that is always centered on the cross. Right. If that is not where we are spiritually, where we are spiritually, then we will, as mentioned just above and from Paul's letter to Timothy, we'll focus on ourselves. Yes. We'll become boastful and arrogant. We'll begin to trust in our deeds. And then there is the great and grave danger of falling into that snare, that trap, that Jesus said many will fall into. Yes. Right? In the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount ends in Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, talking about that day, that great day when we come face to face to him. He said, many will come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. And then Jesus said, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. <clears throat> Matthew 7, 22 and 23. 
they're coming. These are now, obviously these are people who think that they have this incredible relationship with Jesus Christ because of what they have done. So they come into his presence, coming into the presence of the Lord of Lords, coming into the presence of the King of Kings, coming into the presence of the King of Glory, who's standing there waiting to greet his people with nail-scarred hands and saying to Jesus, look what I did. Look what I did. That's holding to your deeds. Instead of trusting in his work on the cross, which is holding to his deeds, right? We are to attend to and observe the cross of Jesus Christ. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1 18. You want power to overcome? Focus on the cross. You want power to be victorious? Focus on the cross. You want power to walk in the victory, the triumph, to be able to say like Paul, I walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus? Focus on the cross. Because that is where the enemy was defeated, yeah. disarmed yeah. and defeated. And that's where you'll see true humility. Paul said it best. If I was to know anything, it's Christ and, and him crucified. crucified. Amen. He didn't say resurrected. He didn't say born. He didn't say any other thing. He crucified. said crucified. Crucified. I have mm -hmm. determined yes. to know nothing but him and Christ and, and him those crucified. those go before him and said, Lord, look what I did. Or just their pride. So, I mean, this is really, it's really important to see this. That this, the connection that Jesus is making here between being a conqueror, being an overcomer, and focusing on what he has done, his deeds. Right. Keep my deeds, he said. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because otherwise there's there's such a danger. It's because it's focusing on yourself. And become self reliant, exactly. self dependent. Okay? It is pride. And you know, it says in Proverbs chapter six that there are six things, yea, even seven, that are an abomination to the Lord. The Lord hates. And the first one is haughty eyes. It's that pride. Yes. And because that's the gateway to all sin. All of the sins that come from there. Okay? And pride is insidious. Mm. I mean, it just keeps poking and poking and poking away at you oh, all I the time. It. Don't I don't doubt that for a moment. Right. And the only way I know to, to deal with pride, because if you look around at what you've got, what you have, what you've earned, what you've done, if you look at how you compare to other people, pride will rise up. But focus on Jesus Christ, the King of glory, nailed to a cross in your <coughs> place. In your place, the great act of worship that that was. Yes. All right? It has to humble you. Absolutely. And it says that if you humble, it says humble yourself and he will exalt you. Because as God the Father raised Jesus from the dead after that cross, mm -hmm. if you humble yourself at the feet of Jesus in front of that cross, I promise you, God will oh, lift you up. He will lift you up higher and higher. All right? So let me go on in that verse. And then it says, To him I will give authority over the nations. Okay. The first thing is, it's worthy of no. It's really worthy of no. I mean, it may, it may sound like, well, this is so obvious. But it's not obvious because I can, I can tell from watching the lives of, or life of the church. Authority is God's to give. Absolutely. Yes. It says, I will give you authority. Well, you know, I say that, but we seem to look for authority from a lot of different other places, all right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go here. Democ mm -hmm. But I will. Mm -hmm. Democracy mm -hmm. is about receiving authority from the bottom up. Yes, which is wrong. Okay? And that's just one of those world systems, and it's, it, it doesn't, work. doesn't work. So, let me just read you a couple of verses to, just to show you this point from Scripture. Pilate said to Jesus... You do not speak to me? You do not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? <clears throat> Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. This man, Pontius Pilate, the procurator, the governor of, of, of Israel in the time of Jesus Christ, he represented, he was the direct representative of Caesar. Caesar, who considered himself and the people considered him to be a god, a living god, right? The most powerful empire on the face of the earth at the time. This man, he held the power of the sword. 
And that's what he's saying to Jesus. Don't you realize I have the power of life and death over you? And Jesus responds by saying, you have no power except my Father gave it to you. Not to Caesar, not the people, not the Senate back in Rome. My Father gave you authority. Every person, Paul wrote in Romans, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Romans 13.1. You know, I, I will. I'm just going to take a little side trip. Okay. Okay. Because, you know, back, I, I always, I have a little saying that I've been using for almost 40 years. Remember Ramah. Because it was at Ramah that the people of God, the, the, the Hebrews, the Jews, came together and they spoke to the prophet Samuel, who was the judge of, of the nation. That was God's authority. And they said to him, give us a king that we might be like the other nations. And God says, that's what you want. That's what you can have. But here's the way it's going to be. And if you want to see a picture of what government is, whether you're talking about in Cuba, in Canada, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Russia or China, you go look at that, and you will see a picture of what the world system looks like. The church doesn't seem to get this, all right? First of all, let me make something clear, right? I'm not talking about capitalism, socialism, communism. That's not world, that's not world power systems. You see, there's two, there's two sides to this coin. There's power and there's money. And they always kind of interlock and go hand in hand. But, but capitalism, socialism, communism, those are economic models, right? The power models are these. And you, you can debate this, but I'm, I'm going to say I, I believe this to be the best summary I'm going to give you right now. A theocracy, autocracy, an oligarchy, a republic, a democracy, or anarchy. Let me just go through that real quick, right? Those are world systems. Every country in the world will fall into one of these. When I say theocracy... That means that there's only one, only God rules. No human rules, only God. Now, a lot, of, a lot of places in the world, in the Arab world particularly, in the Islamic world, they claim to be theocratic. Well, if you want to look at the God of this world, maybe, maybe it is. All right? You've got to make sure you pick the right God if you're going to be in a theocracy. An autocracy is what most of them are. Because an autocracy is where one man. One man, not guy, one man has all the power. That's otherwise known as a dictatorship. Dictatorship. It's like a dictatorship. I want to tell you something. Our theocracy is a dictatorship. Because dictate comes from the word to speak, right? To dictate, to speak. All right? We are led and ruled by the word of God. Yes. But he's a benevolent dictator. Okay? He he speaks. You know, the apostles, when Jesus said, who do you say I am? He said... Will you also leave me, right, when people are leaving? Right. They said, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. The words of our dictator are words of eternal life, right? Whereas Satan is a liar by nature, and he comes to kill and destroy. Right? Death. So an autocracy or an autocratic government is where one man has the power, like Marx says, it's typically a dictatorship. An oligarchy is where a very few number of people have the power. All the power rests in the hand. Now that was a problem in a lot of the uh, Latin American countries. I don't know if it still is, or you know, that, they call them banana republics, where you had you know, a, a small group of maybe five, ten families that ruled an entire country. That's an oligarchy. Right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> in fact now, because you know, a lot of these things take place behind the curtains, behind the scenes. Yes. So, you know, what people call a government isn't necessarily what the truth of the matter is. I, I think that there are fewer people who rule as America is perceived as a democracy. Mm -hmm. By the way, America was not established as a democracy, it was never intended to be a democracy. America is a republic. That's another form here, that's the thing, right? A republic is, a, everything is ruled by law, all right? In theory. In theory. Mm -hmm. A democracy, on the other hand, is ruled by the majority. And, and while America is a, 
uh, republic, it says in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence that the, the authority in this government comes from the, from the people, from the government. From the consent of the government. So it's coming from the bottom up, right? <clears throat> None of that is true. And then the last one I said, and this is a world system, is anarchy. Yes. And anarchy is just chaos. Where is that found in a country today? Um, maybe Missouri, Ferguson, Ferguson Missouri. <laughs> okay, I was thinking more of country, not just parts of the country. Well, it starts little and then it grows. Granted, that's... <clears throat> this, this is what I mean. <laughs> okay. I don't mind getting in trouble. You see, the, the thing is, it's, it's like we would like to be able to classify everything, but it's not quite that clean. You can't pigeonhole it quite. It says in the Bible, in the book of Judges particularly, it says in the book of Judges a number of times, when there was no king in Israel, every man did what was right in his own eyes. What book? Judges. Book of yes. Judges. So what, what happens is, if, it, if, you're not, if God is not the king of your life, if you're not under a theocracy, you may think that you're operating in an autocracy, an oligarchy, or a republic, but the fact of the matter is, it's probably anarchy. And if you don't think it's anarchy... <clears throat> I probably shouldn't be going here at all. You know how I can tell that most of America is an anarchy? Because everybody doesn't think the same. Just get on I-4, the interstate that runs through the middle of town, and watch how people drive. Yeah. Nobody they do, the law. When there was no king, every man did what was right in his own eyes. People do what they think they can get away with. Mm -hmm. that, that's, they're not subject to anything. And that's anarchy. You know, in, in England, England, Hello, my dear brothers, mm -hmm. sisters, all my friends in, in England, I've said, I've said to a lot of them over there, because they have speed cameras on all the roads, and I'll ask them, you know, do you drive the speed limit based on the signs that give you the speed limit, or based on the speed cameras? Because you see people, you know, you get warnings, you see, they, they let you know speed cameras are around, yeah. and as soon as they see a sign for a speed camera, boom, the brakes go on. Well, you're, you're an anarchist. <laughs> <clears throat> because you're not being, it's not the law, it's not, you're not being submissive to governing authorities. You're doing whatever you can get away with, right? The Antichrist will come out of chaos. Yes. He will come out of anarchy. Because the fact of the matter is, when, it, <clears throat> when everything devolves into anarchy, like, I'm, I have to say this, like the riots the first couple of nights in, in Ferguson, Missouri, and I, I'm dating this now, you know. Or even what's going on in Kiev. Well, any any place. But when you get when you get that anarchy, at some point nobody's safe. No. There's no comfort. Nobody, you know, it's it's terrible. People are in fear. And, and then somewhere along the line, it, gets, it becomes so oppressive that you cry out for somebody to come along stop. and and stop the anarchy, right. like they did in Germany yes. in the 30s with Adolf Hitler. And I honestly believe, speaking of these last days, that that's what will happen. We will fall into anarchy, where there is such chaos, where danger lurks everywhere, where peril is everywhere. And remember, Paul said in that second letter to Timothy, in the last days, perilous times will come, that people will cry out for, for somebody to come along and save them. And a politician will arise, and that politician will cry out, I can change everything. I can save you. I can. I can, I can fix it. And people will grasp at straws. Yeah. Well, embrace right? it. I mean, and embrace I think it. I think we've seen examples of that many times in the world, mm -hmm. in our world, in my time, in your time. Okay. So I, I let me. You know, I don't want to go too far in there, but I, I want you to understand. You need to understand that we're not to be conformed to this world, right? Paul wrote to the, in, again in, in Romans. He said, "Don't be tra don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind." When we as Christians grab a hold of any world system to be our deliverance, mm -hmm. we're being conformed to the world. We're not being transformed. I am a I am a theocrat. There is one rule in my life, yes. and that is. God Almighty, the Lord God Almighty, yes. His Son Jesus Christ, and all who He has delegated in authority over me. Mm -hmm. So the fact of the matter is, I know 
for better or worse, I know if the speed limit is 50 miles an hour going through Orlando, if I'm going 60 miles an hour, I'm, I'm in rebellion. And if I'm in rebellion to the governing authorities here, I am in rebellion to God. God. Okay. I was just thinking about, doesn't that, just these little things about the law, a speed limit. It's like, if you can't run with a footman, how do you run with the horse? And that was what Jeremiah said, moved by the Spirit of God. And that's right. If you can't do the little things, what makes you think you're going to be able to do the big things? Okay, so let me return to this verse that we're on. Nations. Okay. This verse, this verse and the next, uh, I, I, I don't understand, and I happen to be in good company. Okay. Let me read somebody who was noted for his wisdom, his insight, his contact with the Holy Spirit of God. As for me, I heard but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. Daniel 12, 8 and 9. Now, the point of that is, Daniel had gotten a revelation. Something had been shown to him. That's revelation. Mm -hmm. But he didn't understand it. Okay? And, and God spoke to him and saying, but you'll, you know, this is, this is sealed up. There won't be understanding till the end of time. Let's read verses 27 and 28. And he shall, now this is talking about the overcomers, right? He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my father, I will give him the morning star. Hmm. <clears throat> now the first part of those verses is a quote from Psalm 2, right? And that refers to Jesus. So the second verse there must take into consideration, you know, later in this book, Jesus refers to himself as the bright morning star. Revelations 22, 16. Hmm. <clears throat> I want to deal with two things here as we come to a close. I want to talk about speculation and conjecture, revelation and understanding. Okay. Yeah. There's a difference between revelation and understanding that's generally misunderstood. If I took <laughs> Alice out right now <clears throat> to our car in the car park, yes. parking lot, and I opened up the hood bonnet oh, of the car, and showed her the engine, I lifted that up, that it would reveal the engine. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't have a clue how it works. No. There would be revelation, but there would be no understanding. Right. Okay? <clears throat> That's typical. I, always, I like to use the example, this may get me in trouble again. The Wizard of Oz. Oh, yeah. Okay? In The Wizard of Oz, at the end of this, and that's a classic, you should, if you haven't seen it, well, ask the Lord, yeah. Because the, the mighty Wizard of Oz, they, they come in the Dorothy, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion have gone on this quest that they were sent on successfully, and they come back, and they're standing before this great thing going, making noise, toot toot, and big, gigantic voice, and fire flame. And, and Oz is not giving them the answer that they want. And as they're standing there, they have the little dog, Dorothy's dog, Toto, Toto runs over to a green curtain and bites this curtain and pulls it aside. And there is man. the man behind the curtain. Operating all this stuff. Yes. Operating all this stuff. And he's saying, paying no attention to the man. Okay. So they look and they see the man and they see all this stuff. So, but amid, the minute the dog pulled the curtain aside, there was revelation. No but there wasn't understanding. Right. Understanding it. followed. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have been given revelation. Mm -hmm. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, God has revealed his plan for us. Yes. Okay. I don't believe there's any more revelation until Jesus returns, okay. when he is revealed as he is, right? But the point is, yes, lots of people can get in and read the Bible and not understand it. Mm -hmm. They have revelation without understanding. Right. Right. Now, the reason I'm saying this, and the reason it's important in this context is, talking about these things, I don't understand what these verses mean about, you know, the coming of the Lord, we're going to reign with him, we're going to rule, we're going to, okay, I, I, I accept that. Mm -hmm. 
but I don't want to speculate on what it looks like. Because I, you know, am I going to have a big office or am I going to have a little office? Am I going to have one of those judge hammer thingies? Am I going to, you know, am I going to have a nice car? I, you know, the details really don't matter to me because I know that at the appropriate time, you know, there's an appointed time for every event. At the appropriate time, I will have understanding that I need. Okay, that's what I believe and trust. The Pharisees, they had revelation. They had heard what God spoke to Moses up on that mountain. Mm -hmm. I mean, they knew. And they literally knew scriptures backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know the word of God when he walked mm -hmm. through their midst. Mm -hmm. Well, you probably notice a little change. We had an issue with the camera, so we have changed uh, the venue, so to speak. And you'll notice that Mark and Alice are not here. They're off, uh, and I'm at our new home office, our headquarters here in Orlando, Florida now. And uh, we had an issue with the camera, so that's the cause of this, but let's get right on. We were talking about, we are talking about, I, I was talking about speculation, how people speculate on things and conjecture, how they figure things out for themselves, even though it says, lean not on your own understanding in Proverbs. And we're talking about revelation and uh, revelation and understanding. You know, and it says in Proverbs that we're to seek understanding. No doubt about that. But you can have revelation without having understanding. That was my whole point. And I, I think we use that word revelation miscorrectly uh, quite frequently. Just talking about, you know, I got a revelation. More often than not, what you got was an understanding of what had already been revealed to you. And I was talking about the Pharisees, how the Pharisees, and you know, I've had this kind of experience in my own life. Uh, I will say, in, in, with some of the people I studied with in the seminary, had incredible knowledge of Scripture, but actually didn't have the right relationship with the Word, didn't understand the Word. And that was obviously the case with the, with the Pharisees, who, as I just said a moment ago, had, you know, they had this, they knew Scripture but they didn't recognize the word when he walked through their midst. And the zealots, in the same fashion, this was a matter of conjecture. Uh, they, they picked and chose those verses in Scripture that suited what they wanted. And that still happens frequently today, you know, which is one of the signs of the last days that Paul talked about to Timothy when he said, you know, in the last days, Men will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers who will teach according to their own desires. The zealots picked those verses that suited what they wanted. So the great danger in that is they were looking for a Messiah who would come and conquer their enemy, the Roman Empire. Part of the problem was their understanding, and this is something we talked about earlier in this study, they didn't understand who the real enemy was. Jesus did come, and Jesus did conquer. This, the enemy was sin, sin in our own lives. And Christ conquered that by paying the price for that sin upon the cross. So the zealots who were rejoicing at the coming of the Messiah. Well, let me, let me just say this. Think, think of this, all right? It says in Matthew 21, the crowds going ahead of him. This is talking about Jesus entering Jerusalem on what we typically celebrate today as Palm Sunday. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Well, the fact is, it wasn't much longer after that that those same crowds were crying out, Crucify him. Crucify him. You know, if you don't have a right understanding of what God has revealed, you're going to go off in the wrong direction. That was my point. And the point of that is, when it comes to some of these verses in the book of Revelation, I know that this is the truth. This is God's word. God's word is pure. God's word is holy and God's word is truth. Do I pray for understanding? Absolutely. 
Do I believe that there are things that, as God spoke to Daniel, have not yet the door of opportunity to understand has not yet been opened? But it's coming. As, as time unrolls and unrolls and unfolds before our very eyes as it's doing, I believe that our understanding of what God has spoken will become clearer and clearer. And of course, the thing that we do have is the Holy Spirit who is sent to lead us into all truth. But that truth does not come just by, you know, wishing for it. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We need to spend time in the word as we're doing here. We need to do that understanding that every word that we read is a revelation from God. And it should be our heart's desire to grow in our understanding and have understanding so that we are walking in the truth. But does it trouble me that I don't understand some things about the, those end days? No, because I, I have confidence that I will in the appropriate time. You know, the Apostle Peter said there were things that Paul wrote that were hard for him to understand. Yes, I want understanding. Yes, you should desire and seek understanding. But don't feel as though you have to force something and understanding into the, to the revelation, okay? Because like the zealots, like the Pharisees, you can easily go off the path. All right, let, let's just end up with this. This, revel, this letter to Thyatira ends, like most of the letters, or like all of the letters, of the seven churches in, in the book of Revelation, with the Lord saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, Jesus talked about the Pharisees, he said, you know, they, they had eyes, but they were blind. They had ears, but they were deaf. You have to hear. And to hear, by the way, I, I go back to the, uh, to hear is to obey. <laughs> Walking in the Word. That's what brings it to life. Interestingly, in Hebrew, the same the word for hear, Shema, and the word for obey, Shema, is exactly the same word. As we, as we practice the word, as we walk in the word, as we are led by the word, our understanding will grow, and you can trust in the Lord. You're not to lean on your own understanding. That understanding, like the revelation comes from God, the understanding has to come from God. Is it good to study? Well, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy again, said study to show yourself approved. Yes, we should be studying the Word of God. But it's not based on your intelligence, because, and I, I said this, and this is probably what I think I should close on. God has appointed teachers in the church. Teachers, like what we're doing here, we can talk and put things into, you, in, into each other's minds, actually. But it says, with the heart, man believes. And as I've said before, it takes the Holy Spirit to take what you have, the word that you've put into your, into your mind, and make it the reality of your heart. And the reality of your heart, the belief of your heart, will determine your life. Don't be afraid of tomorrow. Isn't that what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Don't be anxious for tomorrow, because in due time, in due season, God will reveal to you, will give you understanding. He has revealed it. He will give you understanding of what you need to know, what you need to do. I've seen an awful lot of people go off base when it came to the book of Revelation because they had it all figured out. You know what? I trust in the God that I serve. And I trust that he will give us understanding as we go along. So we're going to be back next week and we will start in the next letter. Hallelujah. So join us then, same time, same channel, <laughs> and uh, we'll be hopefully better set up here. We're just moving back from overseas and getting set up. So be with us. And until then, let me do this. Father, we just praise you and thank you for you are a God. You are a God who gives wisdom, not only revelation, not only understanding, but an, 
and a wisdom to use what you have given us as we properly should. You said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of you, because you give freely to all men. And Lord, so I ask that, that you couple the revelation that you've given us in your word with understanding of those things that we need in our daily lives to walk in a manner pleasing to you. And Lord God, that, that you would let your light shine through us. We would let your light shine in us and through us in a way that would glorify you, that men might see you in our lives. We just praise you and thank you for your Holy Spirit in us to do the work. Hallelujah. Well, you know, if Alice were here with me right now, and she's not, she would say to you, Jesus loves you. And I would say a lot, because that's the truth. God the Father loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son. So don't think that there's no, any good thing that you need that he won't take care of. Till next time, be used by God for the glory of his name. Bye-bye.